Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to another epi of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you guys for a little weekend recap. Full slinging now with LPL even over the weekend. And a couple weeks in means we get to touch on squads that are or were undefeated. A pair of them in the LCS this weekend. Toppling down the Titans at the top of the table, both FlyQuest and Cloud9 drop in those perfect 3-0 and records. We'll start with Cloud9 because I thought it'd be a few more weeks into the season before we got the level of disrespect and cockiness that we got out of the boys. Yeah, I think a lot of people were with you on that one, expecting that, yeah, at some point, a roster with Jojo, Pion, Blabber, and then never mind, the history of Cloud9, this would kick in eventually down the line in this LCS split. We're here in week two. Time to take some lessons, take a sit back and look at the rest of the league and take a realization of, you know what? We're not so head and shoulders above everybody, even when we're on that given day. And a team like Shopify Rebellion, a failed dive bot lane, that is the perfect setup to get that steam rolled in. And the, the vein mid is not the biggest disrespect here. That's a legit counter. That bot lane dive is the most disrespectful. They're not even that chunked and they just walk into a 3v3 scenario willingly and get absolutely stomped. It's a situation where probably three out of maybe four times out of 10, you're getting that off. And it's still not advisable to make that type of play at that point. Point for Cloud9, as you said, the Bane, not really too much of an issue with that one. I think that was the appropriate response. Looking at the Aatrox in the top side, I don't think that was the answer for Cloud9. And specifically, I'm also looking later on, kind of, you know, early mid game, you get around a fight around the Dragon Pit, which Cloud9 does get. You've used everything to get that Dragon. You got to disengage through bot lane, get out of there. But half the team around Fudge says, yeah, let's fight. Let's take this fight. And it is giving it over to Shopify Rebellion. And, you know, this was, uh, I think, the first game where you got the big graphic where it's LCS live patch first, it's a vein mid, oh my god. But, I mean, more importantly, 50% of games now are tanks for insanity. You got the Zac and now the Scion. B-Boy subbed in for this game. I think we both think Shopify uh, was a little better than their 0-3 record dictated. But now, a win with Cloud9 under their belts, they'll be feeling a lot more confident going forward. Yeah, and got to give credit over to, to B-Boy. He's certainly been someone that ourselves and the rest of the community have been critical of this move for TSM. And, and to see it now in action on the Rift and to see him perform, I think out of the first game, there wasn't too much that you could really look at his own performance. But in the second one against Cloud9, it's still the check marks, And that's all you're really asking for at this point for him for Shopify Rebellion. You mentioned the meta and the live patch type of tweakings. I think really the reaction has almost been precautionary more than we have actually seen acted out on the rift. It's seen a lot of it in the pick and ban situation. You know, the twisted fate is that big one where a lot of teams are going, we don't know exactly how strong this thing is. We think it's really strong. Let's just not deal with it entirely and are banning it out type of thing. Love to see a little bit more of that hotness trickle in through the draft. Yeah, and the TF was already sneaking in in 14.1. So now on this new patch, once... Other regions are there. You expect him to be flooding into that pick ban phase. The FlyQuest loss to NRG was much more NRG showing. Hey, we're the defending champs in case you forgot out the LCS. They look bot lane in particular in that laning phase. Obviously, they got camped to no end uh, with this contracts Ivern, but FBI and Huhi looking like a level up from what we got last year. Oh, baby, and this is the FBI that carved out, really emerged himself as a top-notch option in the LCS. This is the type of gameplay that helped him get to their four NRG contracts, really saying, hey, Mr. Inspired, I know you're pretty great, but you missed the year. And in that year, I came up to that top spot of the LCS junglers, showing it full case, the craziness that El Contracto can come up with for this NRG lineup. You know, call me the optimist. I think that this was there were only good outcomes for the LCS in this matchup. Either you had the route of FlyQuest winning, we could talk about that hypothetical or whatever. But it doesn't matter because it's NRG getting that win. And I think at this point, the way that they performed, what they showed, it was that solidification of what you did last year was no fluke. This team is going to compete at that top level of the LCS, and you better be ready for them if you're planning on being there too. 
and I felt I felt bad for Masu in this game. He had no chance to even start playing the game. Three man dives, four man dives. Jensen was always late to the party. Palafox was already there. Either he doesn't roam or the TP is late. The Varus never had a chance to really do anything in this game. We had the Darius out of Whippo Top after he had fun with the Mordekaiser in their first game of the week. The Darius did not have much of an impact. No, it did not have much of an impact. It didn't have much fun up into the big dokes type of matchup and what he was able to get down. I like you bring up Masu. He was a player that we were looking for this week too to be kind of the big boom for him. Someone to, that, you know, didn't quite get in on the excitement and hype of week one. I'm still waiting on that. Still waiting on that brewing. Still believe that that's there for him in this rookie split. It's, again... What can you do with those amount of ganks, you know, and even Busio was the one racking up most of these uh, trade kills. So, yeah, the Varus was just so put behind and then you saw the damage FPI. He was like two levels higher than him for the majority of the game. So really excited to see NRG still playing at an incredibly high level. The only fluke was them getting smashed by Cloud9 in that first game. So excited to see the defending champs playing at a very high level. The defending world champs also playing at a pretty high level, and if I've got one strategy against T1 that I'm doing every game, it's not letting Zeus play Yone. And Yone's already a busted champion, and Zeus is a busted player. And when you combine the two of them, you get Yone 1v4 scenarios. You combine a champion that has the game-breaking abilities like Yone with a player with the game changing personality of Zeus and the ability to pull the trigger like that, yeah, it's not going to be a good situation for you. And it was not a good situation for Hanwha Life because let me tell you, Ziga, he's locking in. Zeka's locking in that Corky after yeah. game one, which we got to look at that game one. It was he's not zero a very and good six. Point. Zero and six. There's too many times that the Corky is not in a good position whatsoever and is absolutely being obliterated and called out by the rest of T1 right onto it and right identifying that this is going to be an option for us to blow it up. Get in game one where even you had a little bit of pushback, a little bit of fight still left in Hanwha life. You go to that game too and it is all T1 all the time. Yeah, that's one of the biggest mid gaps we've seen in a long time. Both games, Faker's getting three, four, five man Nico Alties, and then he's baiting in everybody with Azanias on Oriana, then finding a nice shockwave. Zeka had no impact on either of these games. It wasn't the three Gen G members. Zeka at the forefront, and even Viper, he got nothing going in this series. That bot lane was completely gapped by both Guma and Kyrie. Yeah, I think in game one, you could talk about it being a little more equal in the, in the individual in that bottom lane, that especially when you got to those team fights, it's separated with what type of damage, what type of abilities Guma is able to get out. And then in game two, absolutely put to that uh, pedal to the metal. And as you said, it wasn't looking at Peanut. It wasn't looking at Doran or, you know, all these type of things. It was the existing members of this Hanwha Life team that struggled on the day and really didn't bring their A game against a team like T1, which you gotta lock in with your A game. And I, I know people kind of expected this, but the 3 0, 6 0 game score start for Hanwha Life, they were looking so dominant. It was mostly lower tier teams in the LCK. When they run into that T1 roadblock, all their tires get popped, deflated, and it's back to the drawing board. So nice 3 uh, 1 start for T1 over there. And the only squad. They can really have T1's number is Gen G, and they continue to sit atop the table at 4 and 0, although they were really tested. Down 0 1, down 6K against D. Looked like it was going to be a swift 2 0, but a couple of team fights, a couple of sloppy mistakes by D, enough for them to get back into game two and proceed to stop game three. Oh, this was quite a, an unfortunate example for D plus Kia of the lesson of what type of power Gen G represents in the LCK. They're not one of those teams that you can get those advantages on and then coast it on through. We, we are in that control. Keep it moving down the highway. That's not the way it is against a squad like Gen G. They're going to make you work for it every little bit of it. And if you're not, this is how they get their ways back into games. They've got the skill. That was what this series was about. And it, you know, this is the main critique we were having with D plus all of last year was having these leads and maybe not knowing how to close out or making 
kind of a, a boneheaded mistake in terms of where they are on the map or taking a team fight that they shouldn't and hadn't been seeing any of that in the first three series which is why we were so excited about the level that they were at but this is I, it seems like a the mental boom has switched and now they can't beat Gen G. It used to be years Gen G couldn't take down D plus, but uh, th they had this series and they blew it. They had it, they blew it. It's still one of those ones where I think we can look at the power that we have seen from this D plus Kia lineup and, and what type of promise and you know a, a potential is there as someone like lucid evolves in his own right as an individual player how it involves with the rest of the team because of how you know a vital a role like jungle is but i think this is certainly going to be one where it's an example of again there's going to be some lessons there's going to be some learning pains for this team growing pains when you're looking at d plus compared to a team that has already grown to that elite status in the lck like a genji and you know this is this has been the resurgence of Showmaker back into that elite four, elite three mid laners in the LCK. So even though they're sitting at two and two, I still feel better about the power level that D plus is at. When Showmaker's playing that well, Lucid's continuing to develop and aiming. His CS numbers are absolutely ludicrous through these first four series. I feel like it's unfair to aiming to exist in the LCK when everything gets sucked up into the conversation about Guma and then of course, Pays is so young and he's into the scene. Everybody loses track of what aiming has done, the consistency of being the type of threat that he represents as an ADC. Bring it to the bot lane of D plus Kia. He's got himself a role. Two weeks in and story's the same in the LCK. It's Gen G, it's T1, and everybody's fighting for the other eight spots in the LCK. But uh, maybe things will change, but it just always seems inevitable that it's these two squads we'll be talking about in finals. But it's only two weeks in, so we won't get too far ahead of ourselves. LEC side of things, two-thirds of the way done. That final week of round one action, we got the El Clasico rivalry, G2 versus Fnatic. And at least now, you heard Dracos memeing a bit on the cast, just throwing out all the buzzwords that they need. Dynasty, old kings, rivalry, dominate, blah, blah, blah. Because they used to beat these storylines to death, but now... They're self-aware enough to make fun of themselves, which I love to see. Always good to see a little bit of that self-awareness. And especially, I think, actually, the benefit for the LEC and the way they've grown and kind of supported almost, you know, these national teams, right? You have a Spanish team, you have a French team, all these type of things coming through. You kind of have moved away from that narrative of the legends, the old kings, all these type of things. Always talking about G2 and Fnatic. But what we always are talking about with G2 and Fnatic, apparently, is Caps. And his performance against his former squad was tip-top notch, getting it done on the Akali. It's six years since he was on Fnatic now, and it still feels like he's trying to send a message each and every time. He's solo killing. I think he got three separate solo kills this game, a couple against Oscar Rinnan, the one under turret on Humanoid. This was... An absolute, there were a couple bangers in the LEC this weekend that were incredibly back and forth, but this one uh, was no shortage of plays from both sides of things. Razork had some insane Vi engages going through all five members of G2. Mickey was borderline inting on the Nautilus uh, throughout this one, and of course it ends in classic Han Sama Elder Dragon pentakill fashion. Oh, man. And is there any champion that's going to be utilizing it quite as lethally as someone like Varus right now? The way that lethality is so spiked up there. The Quadra no was almost instant. Oh, my God. It's insane seeing that damage come through. But, yes, it is G2 that outlasts. They get this one. The only thing that I'm left with from this matchup is wanting more. I want this again. I want a best of series in this type of one again. You can slap in LEC, Dracos, bring us in the old kings, whatever you want to say about it, if we got to pay that tax to get us a series between these two mainstays of the LEC. And uh, a couple losses now uh, on the week so far for Fnatic where a couple just specific decisions on either a fight to take, a flank, Oscar in and getting caught out the second time by Caps was kind of the big game changer uh, for this. So even though... They might be slumping into the playoff round a little bit. Fnatic still expecting them to be able to bounce back. And G2 haven't had the cleanest games all split. And 6-2 and two so far honestly seems like a better record than I've expected them to have. 
I, I mean, I think we're just scarred from how things <laughs> were last year for those first two splits for Fnatic. Seeing them at this position feels good. Uh, you're, you're just waiting at that point to see what you can get from both of these squads as you move to that next level, that next stage of competition to the best ofs in the LEC. But right now, we're seeing that competition level. We're seeing proactive plays. As you mentioned, Razork on that buy was really one keeping that game interesting for me. And now... Uh... Heading into that last day, uh, by the time this video's up, you know, the games might be sort of played. But four squads sitting at four and four to close out. Uh, so, you know, standings will get a little bit spicy on that last day. If you if you had to turn, you, it was extra cathartic to see this Akali performance from Caps. Because earlier in the day, you had to watch the Akali performance from Perks against Team Vitality. My man missed so many shurikens. It started, I started feeling bad for him because it was tough to watch. So many of these fights, if he lands some abilities, Team Heretics is winning this whole game. You go through different stages watching that game because at some point in it, you're watching it and you're going, ah, you know, there's another, you know, missed shuriken, all these type of things, but you're going, he's trying, all right? Yeah, oh, that's an opportunity. Ah, you're taking your shot, all these type of things. And then you move kind of into that mid game and you're like, can you hit one of these? We need you to be effective. We need you to have an effect in these fights. And you weren't getting it from him. That one's a big goose egg for me on perks when you're looking at it, especially even worse in that comparison angle, looking at what Caps was able to do and what perks wasn't able to do for his squad. I, you think Yankos is looking across the rift and seeing Viteo play and say, oh man, that could have used that. That's that's the worst head-to-head -head part of this is you're watching Mateo on the Kaisa mid and my guy's popping off, dashing into four people, popping Zanya, surviving. And we had that question mark heading into the offseason. I know Perks, Wonder, Yankos, they're boys, but I got to feel like if you just brought Kaiser and Wonder into this squad and kept Mateo in the mid lane, I'd be feeling a whole lot better about this squad. That's where then a question comes in, whether it's about the environment, personality of the team, that you you wanted that type of reunion for perks and then type of situation. But yeah, if you're just looking at raw gameplay, raw ability at this point in the LEC right now, what we are seeing, there's no question about it that Fateo would have been that better lock and fit for this team. What you could do, you already laid out that we're making the changes, you know, wonder coming in for Evie. That would have been enough for me. For the heretics to take that next step this next year in the lec right now i think they're still struggling in that same territory where they were trying to tread water of the lec last split we're still uh you know the best ofs are when you really get tested in this new format in the lec but we got uh rogue giant x going later today i believe just whoever wins that straight up is getting that final spot the other one going to be eliminated alongside K Corp, RIP Blue Wall. It was a great first split, picking up at least a win, so they avoid the goose egg. Thumbs up. Yeah, look, I, I appreciate them getting that one. And hey, shout outs to SK Gaming. They were making sure nobody was going without a win last year. They're making sure that they're getting one again this year type of situation. It's rough for Carmine Corp. It's another one where, you know, maybe I'm taking my lessons again of teaching, telling people, and maybe not panicking after such a rough week one in, in these splits of the LEC and learning, you know what? Well, yeah, LEC goes, maybe you do got to panic after one week type of situation. Carmine Corp, an unfortunate one, back to the drawing board for Sprint. One of the most highlight ridden, highest caliber, best teams in the entire world from 2023 making their debut. And it wasn't the best parts that we get to talk about because the best squad has one of the worst plays you will ever see from a professional player, Mr. Yagao, making his return to the JDG lineup. And I don't know if he was looking at his shoe, he was taking a sip of water, looking at, not looking at his monitor, because this Azir death to the turret, what, what's going on here, Mark? I, let, me, let me set it up for you. You're up in the top side. You're looking to take a turret. You don't see it, because there's, that's got to be the only explanation of it. But you've, ag you've got turret aggro. You're taking the turret shots. You're Azir. You realize, okay, I can shuffle myself out of here. I'm going to place a soldier behind me. I'm going to get ready for it. Uh, you didn't place the soldier far enough behind you, my good sir. You're still in turret aggro on that. You shuffled to it. You're left with no type of moves after that. It's done, Zo 1, Zo. This is a guaranteed 
top 10 worst plays of all time, arguably a top five or top three worst play of all time. It ends up not mattering at all in the context of the series, but this is <laughs> this is all time going into the low light reel. You see you go afterwards, he's, you know, face palm. Ah, he's, he's chuckling a little because again, it's a meaningless top lane death. Kanavi's just whacking on the turret, looking behind as this, like, what happened? Oh, wait, we didn't even get to see Ruler's reaction down at the bottom lane going, I went from night to this? Holy cow, what is going on? That is unbelievable to see something like that play down. And Yagao is actually a pretty darn decent Azir throughout the history yeah. of his career. Has had some big games, big plays. That is a big no-no up in the top side for my man with the failed shuffle. I'm going to say maybe he saw a, a nice JDG sign in, in the crowd that distract, distracted. I'm going to give him a benefit of the doubt. Uh, it ends up being 2-0 for JDG. It's anything but clean against a weaker rare Adam squad. So still a lot of question marks around this new look JDG on paper again. Yagao for Knight and Flandre for 369. Looks like downgrades across the board, but we'll see. It's it's a difficult task, but I'll ask you to remove that Azir play from your memory for a little bit here yeah. talking about the series because yes, JDG does overall control things even with that pushback and you know how long it takes against Rear Adam. The problem with it, as you mentioned, even removing that Azir play out of your memory, including it as an outlier, but you look at the rest of the LPL, you've already seen a team like BLG, you've seen Knight throttle people already on this new team. This is not the level that you needed to see from a squad trying to establish themselves again into that category of the elites of the LPO. And they're very late to even debut in the year. It's only a single series. We're gonna need a lot more of a sample size to see, but this doesn't look like it's the same Golden Road squad, which you would expect when you're removing two fifths of what we got out of them in 2023. That is it today for League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for joining and hanging out with us and we will catch you on that flippity flip.